All right, so good morning, everyone. Welcome to the first installment of the Linguistic Special Lecture Series this year. I'm Francisco Rosario, Jr. of the University of the Philippines Department of Linguistics. Today's lecture title, The Importance of Bilingual and Cross-Linguistic Studies in Dementia, is part of a series of events in celebration of the department's centennial anniversary. So for those who are tuned in, this event is being live streamed on the official Facebook page and YouTube channel of the UP Department of Linguistics. You may type your questions feedback in the respective comment sections of these platforms, and we'll try to address them later during the discussion. So our speaker this morning is Dr. Jessica De Leon. She received her BA at John Hopkins University where she studied neuroscience and Spanish. She completed her medical degree, neurology residency, and behavioral neurology fellowship at the University of California, San Francisco. Dr. De Leon is currently an assistant professor at the UC UCSF Memory and Aging Center, or MAC, where she provides care for patients with cognitive impairment and dementia. She serves as a principal investigator of a study on how bilingualism, language typology, and genetics affect the symptoms, neuroimaging, and the progression of neurodegenerative disorders. She also leads um, MAC outreach efforts to the Filipino community in San Francisco Bay Area. All right, so good morning, uh, Dr. De Leon. Uh, thank you for accepting our invitation to have this lecture. Yeah, good morning. <laughs> yeah, good to meet you all. It really is an honor for me to, to be here. So thank you very much. So, all right. Is it, should we go ahead and start with some, with our slides for yeah, today? Sure. Okay, all right. Um, so yeah, good, good morning here. It's uh, 6 p.m. Uh, and it's an honor to speak with you. Um, so as, um, as already mentioned, I'm a behavioral neurologist by training. Uh, which means that I specialize in the care of patients who have dementia. Uh, and today I'd like to speak with you about the importance of bilingual and cross-linguistic studies uh, in dementia. So um, this is the outline for the talk today. Um, I'll, I'll have three main parts. Uh, the first part, I'll talk very briefly about studies of bilingualism and dementia using studies from healthy aging and from Alzheimer's dementia. Uh, and then next, I'll speak about what we're learning about symptoms of dementia from cross-linguistic studies. Uh, and then I'd also like to tell you a little bit about uh, the development of something that we're calling the CATS battery, or the Cognitive Assessment for Tagalog Speakers. Um, and then throughout the talk, I, I also want to build in why I think linguistics is important uh, and how it can really be applied to help patients who have dementia. Okay. So, you know, why should we think about uh, language diversity in dementia research? Uh, you know, as you also know, right, over 80% of the world's population is actually non-English speaking. Um, but the majority of the studies that we have to date have still been performed in English speakers. Um, and, you know, in addition to the diversity of the spoken languages in the world, there's also a high prevalence of people who speak more than one language uh, and are bilingual, or even multilingual. Um, this is more than half of the world's population, uh, you know, very high in the Philippines. Um, here in the U.S., it's only about 20% who speak another language besides English at home. Uh, but then I practice in California, um, and so this number is closer to 40%. Um, so I think one of my goals for this talk is going to show that language diversity, language background can influence the aging process uh, and the symptoms of the disease trajectory of dementia. Um, but really, we need help also from linguists to better diagnose dementia um, because you have expertise right, in language typology, uh, language processing, bilingualism, and this is quite valuable. Um, okay, so we'll move on first to these uh, bilingualism studies. Um, so what do we know about the effects of bilingualism in healthy aging? Uh, we know that it has effects on cognition uh, and on imaging, which I'll also show um, on a different slide. Um, and I'll also say when I say bilingualism, um, I mean this as an inclusive term for people who speak two or more languages. Um, and overall, there seems to be a bilingual advantage in uh, something called executive functioning. Um, so this means the mental processes that help us plan, focus our attention, multitask, for example. Um, and the idea is that switching between the languages is a type of cognitive exercise um, and that enhances our executive functioning. Um, and then in addition to this, there's also some advantages for phonological awareness. 
uh, right? Being able to hear the difference between different phonemes. Um, but, you know, there might also be uh, some things that are uh, di more difficult for someone who's bilingual. Um, so they might have equivalent or maybe a little bit lower performance on some other language functions. Um, so if you have to name things very quickly, right, you have to choose between different languages to do that. Um, or if you have to think of all the words in a certain category or that start with a certain letter, it might be a little bit harder. Um, but we also know that bilingual speakers have increased brain volume. Um, both in areas that are involved in executive functioning, um, as well as ones that are involved in language regions. Um, so this is a review, um, and you can see these different colors uh, in the brain. Um, each color represents a different study that found areas of enhanced brain volume um, in healthy bilinguals relative to monolingual speakers. Um, but you might start to notice right, that these colors are in different areas. They don't necessarily overlap. Um, so I'll maybe introduce the idea right, that bilingualism isn't really black or white, right? It's very nuanced. Um, right? There's a variation in age of acquisition, proficiency, how frequently people use their languages. Uh, and so likely this will have an effect in the brain structure as well. Um, another interesting thing is uh, as we move from studies in healthy aging to ones that are in uh, mostly Alzheimer's disease, um, it seems to show that there's a protective effect of bilingualism on uh, cognitive and brain resilience, um, and that it delays dementia onset by about five years. Um, so let me just show you here uh, on the right. Um, so what I mean by resilience. Um, so uh, if you have high resilience, so here, like if you are one of the bilingual speakers, then you might perform better on cognitive tests compared to monolingual speakers, um, compared to, you know, based on the amount of brain disease that you have. And then maybe you can maintain that functioning for longer um, before you start to show signs of dementia and have a, have a bit of a drop. Um, but, you know, the studies are mixed. Um, and it seems that there's a lot of confounders in these studies. So things like education, immigration, they all have roles as well in um, the results of these studies. Um, and then also these studies don't really group, they, they group um, Alzheimer's into one big category. Um, and so they might be missing some of the more network specific effects. So for example, going back to the executive functioning or the language functioning. Um, and we also said, you know, bilingualism is more nuanced um, as we, uh, with age of acquisition, proficiency and so on. Um, so this is uh, one study that we did here at UCSF. We looked at 287 patients uh, who had two different variants of Alzheimer's disease. Um, and, you know, I think a lot of people don't, don't really realize that there's actually different types of Alzheimer's disease. Um, so the one that affects memory is the most common kind, uh, and that's the kind that we call like amnestic AD. Um, but there's also a type of Alzheimer's that affects the, the language system. Uh, and this one has a very long name, uh, which you can see here. Uh, so it's called logopenic variant primary progressive aphasia. Uh, and that's why we just use the acronym to just say LVPPA. Um, so either you can have memory more infected or, or language more affected. Um, but then if you look at um, this graph, we have the clinical variant here. So it's either AD or LVPPA, and then the, the, the monolingual or bilingual status, um, and then the age at which they develop the dementia. Um, so you can see that, um, the, that bilingualism delayed symptom onset in the LVPPA patients, so the ones that had the language symptoms. Um, but not in the amnestic uh, patients, the ones who had the memory symptoms. Um, and then this difference is about by five years. Um, so perhaps bilingualism is providing um, a network specific advantage um, here in the language networks. Um, so uh, to summarize this section, you know, I'm hoping I can show that um, bilingualism affects performance on cognitive tasks. Uh, it also affects brain structure, and then it contributes to uh, cognitive and brain resilience although it also probably depends on the type of dementia. Um, and then I'll say though, you know, even though we are starting to learn these things, when we see someone in clinic, uh, we're not really taking this into account very much. Um, so for example, their scores on their test, their brain imaging uh, might actually be affected by the fact that they're bilingual, um, but we're not really considering that a lot of times. Um, so just something that we are trying to do better job of. Um, okay, so moving on to some cross-linguistic studies um, and the importance in uh, dementia. 
Um, so as I mentioned, you know, I, I, um, I see patients in clinic. Um, I work with people who are starting to notice cognitive changes, who have different types of dementia. And right now when they come to the clinic, um, you know, we spend time, we take a history, we learn about their symptoms. Uh, maybe we get some blood studies or um, spinal fluid studies. Um, we try to get uh, an MRI of the brain. Um, and then another important part is uh, the cognitive test that we do. Um, so for example, if we're doing a very simple one, we might just ask, okay, can you please draw a clock? Uh, and then uh, see if they can do that. Um, and then we often go into more detailed assessments with neuropsychologists as well. Um, so I'll just give this example. So why do we need cross-linguistic studies uh, in our dementia evaluations? Um, so in the U.S., we often give tests that are really made for English speakers uh, here in the U.S. context. Uh, so I'll just give you a second. I don't know how many of you know um, what this is called. Um, so this is a beaver. Um, the problem is, right, beavers are very culturally, linguistically specific. Um, and, you know, they're, I, don't think, I, I don't think they exist in the Philippines, right? Um, so I had a patient in clinic. Um, she's a Tagalog speaker. She came in. Oh, I, you know, I, I don't know what that is. Okay, it's a Tagat. And so I was like, well, is that close enough? You know, I don't, I was like, well, it's kind of, but not really, right? Um, so I, I think that, you know, even though she had a high proficiency in, in English, she, she still had trouble with this task. Um, so what we don't know, right, if you speak another language besides English and you get this question wrong, right, is it really because you have dementia? Um, or is it really just that you don't have the word in, that, in, in your language or you never learned it in English, right? Um, so really, I, I think we need better tests that are more culturally appropriately, appropriate for different populations that are really made for the vocabulary and for the structure of these different languages. Um, and, you know, I'll, I'll say that there is starting to be a lot of this in other countries as well, um, including in the Philippines. So I know of ones that are out of uh, St. Luke's. Uh, and uh, I think Dr. Jackie Dominguez's group has uh, good studies on this as well. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of room for improvement, um, especially uh, for tasks that are related more to speech and language. Um, and, you know, we just want to provide better care. Um, so that's where this comes from. Um, so when it comes to cross-linguistic studies, um, I might like to tell you a bit about this framework for dementia using um, ones that affect speech and language abilities. Um, so, you know, I, I, it turns out that there's different kinds of dementia um, that are, and there's actually ones that really do affect speech and language. Um, they're not so common uh, compared to Alzheimer's disease, so many haven't heard of them before. Um, so I'll introduce them here, though. Um, so I'll take you through this table. Um, and really the main idea that to take away, um, so there's going to be different variants um, that have different clinical symptoms, different imaging findings, and then different pathology. So if you look under the microscope, it, it will look different. Um, so this first variant is something called non-fluent variant uh, PPA. Um, and if you see them in clinic, they, they show difficulties with grammar um, and with something called apraxia of speech. Uh, and this is where they have trouble with pronouncing words. They have trouble with planning how to say words correctly. Um, and then if you look at their imaging, um, they have atrophy in this, these red areas. So uh, frontal atrophy on the, on the left side of the brain, uh, and then something called tau in, in their pathology. Um, the second kind of variant is something called semantic variant PPA. Um, here, it's a loss of semantics, so they lose object knowledge. Um, so an example, maybe they don't know how to use a knife anymore, you know, that it's sharp, you shouldn't poke you know, with a knife, it's bad. Um, they also have anomia, so difficulty naming. Uh, and then they have something called surface dyslexia, which I'll tell you about um, in a few slides. Um, and then when you look at their brains, they have volume loss or atrophy in this green region, the, in the temporal lobes, uh, and then also a different kind of pathology. Um, and then this is one that we were introduced to a couple slides back. Um, there's a third variant called logopenic variant PPA, um, or LVPPA, um, and this one has a phonological deficit, so difficulty more like on this, like with syllables, for example, um, impaired repetition, uh, also trouble with naming, um, and then their atrophy, their brain volume loss is in the purple region uh, that you see here on the brain, um, as, and as we mentioned before, it's actually a type of Alzheimer's disease. Um, but looking at this table, you know, for you linguists, you might notice there's nothing here about other types of language features, like tone, for example. There's nothing about tone 
production, tone comprehension, even though it's such a feature right, of a lot of different languages. Um, so in addition to the trouble with the test right, that I mentioned with a Beaver example, uh, being very English focused, maybe very American focused, right, the diagnostic criteria, these are, um, this is what we actually use across the world, right? but it's really based on symptoms that we see in English speakers. Um, so just maybe another place where we can have some improvement. Um, so for these next slides, I I'll give you some examples of uh, how we, how others have also been adapting tasks that are really probing for deficits um, that are tailored to the language. Um, so I'll start with Spanish first. Um, so I mentioned earlier, there's something called surface dyslexia, um, and that's associated with the SVPPA variant um, in English speakers. Um, and what this means is that um, people have trouble reading, so that's the dyslexia part, um, or trouble writing and spelling, that's the dysgraphia part. And this is with low frequency exception words or irregular words. Um, so some examples for English, right? This is things like yacht, island, kernel, pint. Um, so ones that you kind of have to memorize how to say it. Um, and because instead of sounding it out, right, using a phonological route to say the word, you actually have to use um, a different route, a semantic route, um, to know how to say the word correctly. Um, and you, you rely on your ability to recognize the whole word, um, and then you use your semantic memory, your lexico-semantic knowledge, to access um, how to correctly pronounce the word. Um, so it's a bit kind of like non-transparent in that way. Um, but right, in SVPPA, um, this semantic route is impaired. So um, they're not able to access it. So instead of saying um, island, right, they might say island um, instead. Um, but if you give them what we call pseudo words um, or words that are made up, words that are supposed to be pronounced um, by sounding it out. So using this phonological route, um, nor using normal rules of English. So um, snite, hoach, smode. Um, they can actually pronounce it okay because their phonological route um, is still okay, it's intact. Um, but in Spanish, um, and actually the Galog as well, right? It's actually very uncom uncommon to have irregular words like this. It's, it's a more transparent language. Um, so you can't really test for surface dyslexia the same way you, know, you would test for it in someone who's an English speaker with SVPPA. Um, so um, with Spanish, though, it does have accent marks. So whenever you have something that's pronounced um, you know, a bit differently, you put an accent um, so that you know how to pronounce the word correctly. Um, so maybe this is something we can use instead to, um, to probe this kind of feature. Um, so this is an example from a reading task that was shared by one of our collaborators, um, Dr. Matias Guillo, he's in uh, Spain. He developed a task that uses um, irregular exception words, and he takes off the accent. Um, and so this is a substitute in a way for irregular words. Um, so for those of you who know Spanish, right, the accent or the, the word stress should come on the second to the last syllable if it's um, if the word ends in a vowel. So uh, you have to put the accent here to know it's actually vispera and not vispera. Um, so he he wanted to see if maybe this would this would work to help um, kind of probe at the same thing as for English. Um, and so he did find this. He found that the SVPPA patients had trouble reading these kinds of words when they took off the accents. Um, and then also, which is nice, um, he was able to show that they had um, that he associated it with decreased functioning in the temporal lobe, so the area that um, is has atrophy for the SVPPA patients. Um, so it seemed to be to work in that way to to get at the feature of it. Um, and then he also developed a non-word reading task. So this is like the pseudo word task, um, where he made up words that you should be able to sound out um, using the phonological route. Um, and usually, or sometimes with people who have the LV PPA type of variant, um, the one that's associated with Alzheimer's disease, um, they're the ones that have trouble with this kind of task. Um, so if you see here on the right, um, it's kind of maybe hard to see, but there's little blue dots. Uh, and that's where uh, it's actually parts of the brain that are important for phonology. So it made sense that um, that's why it went along with the impairment for the non-words as well. Um, and then I'll show a slide from um, a Cantonese language battery. Um, these ones are really uh, championed by one of my colleagues here at UCSF. 
Um, so she looked at orthographic or writing deficits in Cantonese speakers with the NFV PPA, the non-fluent variant of PPA. Um, and, you know, since lexical tone, it's not a feature of English. Um, and then Cantonese uses a logographic script instead of an alphabetic script. Um, she really had to develop new tasks, right? She couldn't just use ones from English. Um, so she was able to show that the um, that they actually have different types of errors um, in these Cantonese speakers uh, when they have the non-fluent variant of PPA. Um, and then uh, one more study from our group. Um, this is a study that looked at English and Italian monolingual speakers with NFE PPA. Um, so you can see here that they have um, similar areas of atrophy, um, but they have differences in their symptoms. So the English speakers are in, green, are in orange, and then the Italian speakers are in blue. Um, so the English speakers have more distortions or more um, trouble with pronouncing words, while the Italian speakers have more um, what we say are phonological paraphasias, where they kind of mix up the syllables. Um, so, and then they also had more difficulties with syntax. Um, so just to show again, you know, that the language that you speak can also affect the symptoms that you might have if you have dementia. Um, and then I'll also say, you know, I think that the English speakers had more trouble with distortions um, because there's more consonant clusters in English. Right? So if you think about the word string, right, you have S-T-R. Um, so that gives actually, um, it's kind of more prone to having these types of speech sound errors. Um, but for Italian and for Tagalog as well, right, you don't really have those consonant clusters. It's you know, consonant, vowel, consonant, vowel. So, um, so the summary for here uh, is to just say that, you know, it seems like language typology can also affect the speech and language symptoms of dementia. Um, okay, so for this last part, uh, I'd like to tell you a little bit about some work we're doing to develop a cognitive battery um, for Tagalog speakers here in the U.S. Um, so it's very early stages, and you know I, I need to acknowledge I'm here in the U.S., so it's it's not the same right, as being in the Philippines. Um, and I think really my hope is that um, we can partner in, in a lot of ways, and uh, I think we need to in order to do this well. Um, and then just some background about here in the U.S. Um, and why I think it's important to do this. Um, so in the U.S., um, there aren't a lot of studies that look at Asians in different subgroups. Um, but one did show that the highest incidence of dementia was in, um, in Filipino Americans. Um, and then there's a lot here in the US, right? Um, so it's the largest Asian American group here in California, as well as in 10 other of the 50 states. Um, so it makes sense, right, that, that the Galo is actually pretty widely spoken here. Um, but also to acknowledge, right, there's such a rich language experience um, that we have as Filipinos. There's so many Philippine languages. Um, and then such a high prevalence as well of bilingualism and multilingualism. Um, so our goals were to either translate or adapt um, or create really from scratch de novo um, tasks. Um, so we did uh, try to adapt a little bit from ones that are used in the Philippines, ones that are used here in the US, um, but there really were some that they, they didn't really exist yet. Um, so on our team, we have a linguist, neuropsychologist, uh, we have a speech language pathologist to help um, all together. Um, and right now we're mostly testing just for feasibility um, in healthy older adults. Um, and another you know, major, and really in some ways the main goal uh, is really to start to connect even more with our community. Um, and we had the opportunity to get a lot of input, a lot of advice from our elders um, throughout this process. Um, and you know, we're also hoping that this is a way that it's a little more comfortable um, to start an evaluation for cognitive concerns. Um, Cause you know, it's not always so easy to, I think, have those kinds of discussions. Um, yeah, and I don't expect you to read this whole slide, it's too much. Um, so this is just to show that the battery is pretty comprehensive. So it includes tasks from the four main cognitive domains. So this includes tasks of memory, um, visual spatial functioning, um, executive functioning, and then speech and language. Um, and then we also are collecting some questionnaires because uh, we think it's important and it's gonna affect results, right? To have, uh, to know about things like acculturation, enculturation, mood symptoms, um, other languages, so bilingualism. Um, and then as part of the study, we're also offering a neuro exam as well as uh, the MRI brain imaging. Uh, we get a, a scale of how they're functioning in everyday life. 
Um, and then we also provide feedback and some education through a conversation. Um, and then we give a written visit summary um, so that they can take it to their doctor if they want. Um, and mostly today, I'll just focus on some tasks that are related to um, speech and language uh, that we've been working on. Um, so one task is a motor speech exam. Uh, we are trying to look for dysarthria, which means slurring of speech. And then, as I mentioned before, something called apraxia of speech. Um, so this is trouble with the motor planning. Um, and then, so then also trouble with pronouncing words. Um, and we know that these are features or can be features of dementia. Um, but we also knew, okay, we have to actually adapt it, right? We can't just use what's in English. Um, so some things we were trying to keep in mind, right? We know that um, the Galog has a lot more repeated syllables. Um, and more syllables per word. Um, so in order to really kind of tax that motor speech network, we had to, to a comparative level, we had to make longer words. Um, and then for apraxia of speech, there's not much published yet on, on what this looks like um, if you are a um, Tagalog speaker and you have neurodegenerative disease. Um, but you know, we suspect that it's different right, from English um, because in English, we normally catch it in the words that have the consonant clusters. So um, like the string example, again, which doesn't happen um, in, in Tagalog. And then um, we also catch it sometimes in multisyllabic words um, that have a lot of travel where, um, you know, you're, maybe you say the first sound in, that's kind of more um, closer to the back of the throat. And then the next sound is maybe like with the teeth or with the, so with a lot of travel in the speech system. Um, so what we did, we tried to create some sentences that do have a lot of travel. Um, and then in a way, they're kind of more like tongue twisters. So we, and then we also asked the participants to read the sentences um, like with, uh, okay, what's the, so with emotion, so that if they have any trouble with prosody, uh, we might be able to catch that. Um, and prosody is like the pitch of the voice when you say the sentence. Um, and we know that prosody can also be affected in someone who has neurodegenerative disease. Um, and then lastly, you know, of course, there's some differences in phonemes as well. Um, and so this was developed and kindly shared by one of our colleagues in the Philippines. Uh, and it contains all of the phonemes that exist in Tagalog. So it gives us a really good way if knowing to know if someone is having trouble with pronouncing certain sounds. Um, and then it, just a good sample of motor speech abilities um, in general. Uh, and then, you know, I just like the story, just the content of the story as well. Uh, this is from the Mint, um, which is a commonly used naming test here in the U.S. and, and then internationally as well. Um, but we actually found that people struggled a lot with it. Um, so, you know, if you don't allow people to use any English words, they're actually scoring about 15. And this is out of 32. Um, so not great. Um, it got a little bit better when we say, OK, it's OK to say some words in English. Um, so they're scoring about 24 out of 32. Um, but still not, not great. Uh, and so, you know, there's some issues with the test. Uh, so it has a lot of cognates, a lot of borrowed words that are the same, like compare or similar to English or similar to Spanish. Uh, and that's something we try to avoid um, because um, it can affect the validity of results, especially if someone is a bilingual speaker. Um, and then these are just some of the comments from some of the participants. Uh, so this is so American, uh, like beaver, you know, there's no word. I don't know a word of, for porthole um, in Tagalog. Um, and then also, you know, scarves. Um, it's not really something that you really use much in the Philippines. So for them, it felt very culturally irrelevant. Um, so I think what we learned from this, we, we really need to develop a different kind of naming test for, um, for Tagalog speakers. Um, and then something we developed more from scratch is something called the semantic reading tasks. Um, in English, there's something called surface dyslexia, like we talked about before, um, right, where you have to read irregular words, um, like the yacht, island, kernel example. Um, but, uh, you know, in order to really tap into that network um, for the Tagalog, those words are rare, right? Uh, but what is what does exist is word stress that varies. Um, so for something that might even be spelled the same way. Um, and so really it's the context that um, can help you decide how to pronounce that word. Um, so, you know, whether or not this is, um, let's see, bukas or bukas, right? Um, so maybe if someone has trouble with this type of task, then we, uh, it means that they're having trouble with their lexicosemantic networks. 
Um, okay, and then, so, you know, I think linguists really have a lot of role in helping to improve a lot of these types of tasks, uh, and then especially ones for syntax. Uh, and so, you know, I, I was actually a little bit sure, shy about showing these ones because I know that they need a lot of work. Um, I will say thank you to Elsie, though, because she helped with these drawings. Um, so the goal is for these syntax tasks, so we have syntax comprehension and then a syntax production task. Um, is to test for uh, deficits in grammatical voice patterns, right, in Tagalog. So either active or, sorry, agent or patient voice um, using declarative relative clauses. Um, and as you all know, even more than me, right, that Tagalog is verb initial. Um, and we have the system, right, where it's the voice affix affixes that really um, tell which argument is prominent. So if it's the agent or the patient, um, so we're trying to examine better if um, and how um, these morphosyntactic deficits um, show up um, in Tagalog speakers who have um, different types of neurodegenerative disease. Um, so for this particular task, we're asking people to um, say which picture goes with a sentence. Um, and then for this one, uh, we're asking people to complete the sentence um, and then they have to use the words that are here. Um, so a lot of things that I think are still kind of early and we're hoping can get better with some time. Um, so our next steps for the, this CATS battery, uh, we want to continue to adopt the current tasks, um, so especially our syntax ones, uh, the naming tasks. Um, we eventually want to see if we can correlate the findings with neuroimaging. Um, and then we want to also start to administer to patients who have dementia, who have neurodegenerative disease, um, and then start to build this into the larger work of cross-linguistic and bilingualism and bilingualism uh, bilingualism studies. So um, thank you. These are all the people who have contributed and have been involved in this research. Um, you know, I'm very grateful for all that they bring and, and what we can teach each other. Um, so this is my, uh, this is our website and my email if you want to contact, um, and yeah, yun lang. So, okay, I will close my slides. Okay, so thank you very much, Dr. De Leon, for that very interesting and insightful presentation on, on the role of bilingualism in cognitive and brain resilience. We know that most Filipinos are at least bilingual. However, most of us do not realize or appreciate the benefits of being um, bilingual. And we know that there are economic benefits of bilingualism, that there are also cognitive benefits of bilingualism. Like for example, that you, um, things you've mentioned on cognitive uh, language tasks, executive functioning, and you also presented the importance of cross-linguistic studies to improve the diagnosis of dementia and shared with us the preliminary data that you have from the speech and cognitive battery for um, Tagalog speakers. Um, yeah, maybe a lot of um, our viewers right now are interested um, since you've mentioned that bilingualism in a way prevents or at least delays the onset of dementia. Are there strategies or linguistic strategies to prevent or delay dementia? Yeah, so uh, with bilingualism, there's still a lot of, I think, debate, you know, what mm -hmm. it is about the bilingualism piece. Um, so it's probably more that you have to be kind of actively using both languages, so how much you're switching between both mm -hmm. languages, that's important. Um, so maybe more effect there compared to somebody who studied it in school and then maybe doesn't use the second language anymore. Um, and then even more broadly, right, how to protect the brain. Uh, we always talk a lot about brain health. Um, so this is where things like exercise come in, yeah. um, you know, lots of fruits and vegetables in the diet, um, keeping your brain cognitively active, having a lot of social connections can also be mm -hmm. protective um, along with the bilingualism. Oh, so. okay. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm also curious, since you, you uh, presented different errors, right, depending on, I mean, based on the, the tests that you conducted, like we see different errors depending on the language. And um, well, in your study, how did the Filipino bi bilinguals perform in the, in the test? Like what are the common errors for most Filipinos who participated in the test? Yeah, you know, so we still are gathering, it's still very early, so we don't mm -hmm. really know yet. Um, mm -hmm. I'll say that the ones 
it's more like trying to figure out what the norms are. What are the what are the terms or what what kind of even language people use to answer questions? Um, so I don't know yet. Um, we know that we had to make some changes from um, like the Philippine version of mm -hmm. one. Like we have to ask, like for example, the date. Uh, well, you know, it's, I think it's also just hard to formally give the date in Tagalog. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of us don't. So, um, so they we have to accept it in English and Spanish mm -hmm. or you know Tagalog. So some kind of combination. Um, mm -hmm. So it would be almost an error, I think, if if they're not working with someone who can switch between the languages and understand. Mm -hmm culturally, linguistically, but that's actually not wrong, mm -hmm. not necessarily. Um, and then the other types of errors, like on the naming, it's it's the ones that are less common or the ones that don't have a, an equivalent in, in Tagalog. Um, the syntax ones, we don't know yet. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. We have this question from Dr. Christina Gallego. Um, did you control for language mode, that is, uh, if the tests were conducted when speakers are primed to think or speak in monolingual um, versus bilingual mode, studies such as Ross Jean's work um, claim that there's a difference in language use in terms of language mode, particularly in picture naming tasks such as um, Mint. So she wonders if this somehow affected the results of your study. Yes, yeah, and I, I completely agree with this. Uh, so what we've been doing is having, we have a, a separate testing day where all the testing is in Tagalog, and then another day um, at least three months after where they're doing testing in English. Um, so we're trying to separate out um, when people are using one language or the other. Um, so having a day where they're not, having two separate days, so they're not supposed to be switching so much um, between the two languages. Um, but, you know, it's, it's hard because, um, you know, we're, we tend to code switch a lot, right? We switch a lot between the two languages, but we try to make them just stay in, in one language for that day. Okay. And uh, another question from Sandra. Okay, so when conducting this survey, are you looking for native Tagalog speakers or any field AMS who speak Tagalog? Okay, so these are methodology questions. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so she has like so. Okay. Yeah, we're looking for um, anyone. Yeah, anyone who speaks Tagalog, even if it's not, you know, they're because right, Tagalog is not necessarily first language for mm -hmm. everybody. Yeah, so as long as they speak Tagalog, um, we don't have tests yet for Ilocano though, um, mm -hmm. but I'm still interested as well. Um, so yeah, send me a message uh, and we'll see mm -hmm. what we can do. And another comment from. Teen um, De Carisa, so multilingualism increases cognitive reserve. Um, your thoughts or comment on that? Yeah, so I agree. We don't have as many studies on multilingualism compared to bilingualism. Um, so I think we're not so sure if you have like um, like a an, an even greater effect if you speak more than two languages. Uh, but there's some doubt. Maybe it, it helps to be multilingual as well. So I'm not mm -hmm. sure. Okay, and uh, um, from yeah, from Elsie Marie Orr, uh, you mentioned that age of acquisition and level of proficiency in the languages speakers have in their repertoire are some of the factors that could affect susceptibility to developing dementia. So can you speak more about some of the current research um, about this? Yes. Uh, so this is a really good question um, and uh, plays into a lot of the models that are currently being developed for bilingualism. Mm -hmm. um, so, and these are, these are perfect uh, questions. So age of acquisition, uh, we think that, you know, people who learn um, a language early, like the language is more stored, I guess, kind of in uh, lower parts of the brain, maybe like in more temporal regions of the brain. Um, and then if, as you gain proficiency, um, you start to, when you are first learning a language, maybe you use more of the frontal regions of the brain. And then as you mm -hmm. become more proficient, the language kind of moves towards the back of the brain. Um, so, depend, so depending on what type of dementia, um, you might have different susceptibility, right? So if mm -hmm. you have high proficiency and this part, the back part of your brain is very strong, then maybe you're more protected from types of dementia that affect the back of the brain. Um, I don't know if that makes sense. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, 
yeah and then yeah so it, it it they they probably affect proficiency in terms of where in the brain and, and the type of dementia um mm. and then but then also the overlap between the two languages so mm. um so yeah probably if you are proficient learned both languages early it's probably more protective um, but mm. still no completely i see yeah. and i think you also mentioned something about like social factors, including migration, and uh, I don't know, perhaps socioeconomic status. Can you talk more about, you know, um, you know, susceptibility to developing dementia um, based on these factors? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and this one is, is harder to, to, I think, separate out, right? Because at least here in the U.S., um, mm -hmm. you know, people who have high, and the people that we study uh, sometimes have high education already, and then they're also bilingual. Um, so we don't always know if it's they have high education and that's why um, they have more cognitive or brain reserve. And mm -hmm. really the bilingualism isn't adding anything. Um, there's also, you know, the, as you mentioned, like the, you know, the economic um, advantages of, of speaking more than one language. Mm -hmm. um, there is some interesting work from Dr. Aladi in India. Mm -hmm. um, so, and uh, she's showing that even in populations who are illiterate or who don't have high education, um, if they're bilingual, they are still seeing um, uh, cognitive reserve or so a delay in, in symptom onset. Um, so I don't know if that answered. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's that's interesting. <laughs> um, and another question from Teratina, as you said, uh, there's a huge bias in the field towards weird, that's Western education, industrialized, religious and democratic societies. So the nature of bi or multilingualism in other kinds of societies such as Small scale, small scale ones are claimed to be different. So do you think there would be a difference in the effects of bilingualism in small scale societies in individuals' um, cognitive abilities? Yeah, that's a really good question. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so you're, you're right about the nature, right? So I think um, whether or not people are learning their languages at home versus at school, um, so kind of different that way. Mm -hmm. um, and then differences in the effects in small scale societies. Yeah, so maybe this also gets back to um, if by small scale we mean, yeah, ones that are not as educated, not as Western, you know, not as weird, um, that maybe actually bilingualism has even more of a protective effect because they aren't getting the extra effect from education or from, you know, good health system that you would get in these weird societies. So. Uh, but yes, we need more studies in different contexts than, you know, mm -hmm. just the ones that are weird. Mm -hmm. so. Okay, and another um, comment from a speech language pathologist, Carla Cuadro. We found in one of our studies that code switching among Filipinos with aphasia happens when speaking about own thoughts or feelings, switching to English if talking about medical terms or procedures. Your thoughts on this? Yes, <laughs> this is so true. Uh, so the way it kind of shows up here in, in our clinics is sometimes, um, even though, you know, we know that someone is maybe more proficient in, in Tagalog, they still prefer to do try to do the testing in English. Uh, so there's some troubles there, right? Um, there's also trouble with the vocabulary that we use, right? Because even for me, like there's some words I know in Tagalog, but I don't really know in English mm. right? or ones that we only use in the clinic. I don't know how to use a lot of the medical terms actually um, mm. in Tagalog. So I agree. Mm. Uh, and I, I could totally see that there's why that context is, is different right? when you're talking about your thoughts and your feelings versus um, mm. yeah, something like more. medical terms and procedures. And I think this is not just applicable to, to um, aphasia patients. I think a lot of Filipinos um, yeah, experience this. Right. Um, another comment from Tin Guevara. Uh, Most Filipinos are multilingual because Visayan speakers also know Tagalog and English. So is the number of languages and duration of use um, part of demographic so that it could be factored in the analysis in the future? And this is really interesting um, Dr. Jackie Dominguez is part of a team that developed MMSE in different Filipino languages. Yeah, yeah, so we will, we, um, and I, I totally, yeah, so we, in our bilingualism questionnaire, um, we're making sure to ask about these different factors uh, because I completely agree that it's so important to, you know, really to be able to interpret our results. Uh, and yeah, I, I'm a really big fan. <laughs> 
because of Dr. Dominguez's work. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, um, yeah, follow up question from Carla uh, Cuadro. Your thoughts, please, on Filipino dementia, like ease of verge retrieval in code switching, cognitive load? Yeah, um, so Filipino dementia, specific, I guess more specifically, mm -hmm. um, and word retrieval for code switching. Um, you know, I, like compared to people who maybe speak other languages. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that, or and this, I don't know. Uh, so this is my guess, um, right? That um, it probably depends a little bit on the context. But my guess is Filipinos are probably pretty good at it. I mean, we, we taglishize a lot of things already. Mm -hmm. as as, right? So maybe compared to somebody who speaks a different language. So um, like here in the US, um, for example, if people speak English at work and then, but then their family only speaks another language, they don't switch as much um, mm -hmm. between their languages. Um, but then here in the Bay Area, you know, it's, it's very easy to switch no matter where you are. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, I'm also curious about the, I mean, how um, the findings of your research, particularly on the cognitive battery test, could, um, in a way, improve you know, the diagnosis of dementia at the same time improving the, I don't know, I don't know quality of life of the patients. Yeah, so I think for the for a diagnosis, it's it's really important because um, you know I think some of these syndromes, some of these dementia syndromes that affect language are more rare. Um, mm -hmm. But we don't, uh, you know, as as far as I know, there aren't really a lot of tests that really look at speech and language. Mm -hmm. uh, and sometimes that's actually how we can best diagnose um, different types of dementia. So I think it's important there. Uh, and then also just for bringing, you know, away from the weird, you know, the earlier comment about moving away from weird research, um, I mm -hmm. think it's important because of that. Um, I think there's a quality of life piece um, or maybe a diagnostic piece with being able to use whichever language you prefer to use um, when you're being evaluated. Um, but then, yeah, I think more practically, you know, I'm not sure yet some of these more practical applications of how to use these batteries. Um, yeah, so that one is, is a good question. <laughs> okay. We're looking forward to, you know, the, you know, to your to your conclusion, to your findings and the research. And um, well, I think we're able to um, answer all the comments or questions posted on Facebook and YouTube. And perhaps we can, you know, end the discussion, like your your final thoughts or Final words before we conclude or end the discussion. Yeah, I, I would say just, you know, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Uh, you know, I think that there's a lot of room for, for collaboration, for working together and for learning from each other. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah, just thank you again. So. All right. Okay, so oh, again, thank you very much, um, Dr. De Leon. So I hope this is not the last time and we hope to um, have you again and share with us the findings of your research and perhaps um, have some collaboration in the future. All right, so thank you very much, uh, Dr. De Leon. So um, for the details of the upcoming events and activities in commemoration of the centennial anniversary of the department, you can check our official, oh, um, official social media accounts but before we end this yes i would like to um give this certificate of appreciation to dr jessica de leon for delivering a lecture titled the importance of bilingual and cross linguistic studies in dementia as part of the linguistic special lecture series organized by the up department of linguistics given this 28th of January, 2023, signed by the Chair of the Department of Linguistics, Maria Cristina Gallego. Again, thank you very much, Dr. Gallego, uh, Dr. Uh, De Leon. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Okay, so for the details of the upcoming events and activities in commemoration of the centennial anniversary of the department, you can check our official social media accounts. And for those who are tuned in, Find the accomplished evaluation form in the comment section to let us know how you
you have found our event today and help us improve our future events and activities. You will also receive your certificate of participation after answering the evaluation form. And take note that the form will be open until 5 p.m. today, January 28th. So thank you for joining us this morning. Keep safe.